Very often when you think about robots, we think about machines like these guys, and they're very much products of their time. But now when we build robots today, looking forward into the future, those robots reflect that as humans we're having a bit of an identity crisis. All the things that make us uniquely human perhaps have been eroded. But what we can see from these robots is that they are not just a recent phenomenon. We stretch back at least the 1920s, and fascinatingly, you can go back even further than that. Five hundred years ago, the word robot didn't exist, but people lived in a world of mechanical people. Most often they were found in churches, places of worship. You get crucifixion scenes, and a lot of the Bible stories are reenacted using tiny mechanical people. These aren't reflections, again, of industry or technology. These are reflections of people's religious faith and their devotion and their sense of belief. People who were affluent and they had wealth and status to prove and to show off realized the power of automata. So rather than being just found in churches, increasingly you find these amazing mechanical people in theaters, in cabinets of wonder, these amazing places. The lathe is an amazing demonstration of the imaginative power of machines. What you have here is a machine which could, completely without any human intervention, produce a tiny, detailed piece of wood turning. It's part of a generation of machines which could write, which could play musical instruments, and it's a very potent reminder of uh, how a machine could be used to demonstrate the power and the authority of the person who owned it. Since the Industrial Revolution, technology came on in leaps and bounds. By the 1920s, we're living in a mechanized world, factories and mills and power looms and cars and Henry Ford. And that sort of environment breeds some amazing new ideas. Fritz Lang makes the film Metropolis, which has Maria, the first blockbuster robot. Robots embodied the most astonishing new technologies, things like aluminium or batteries or electric motors, taken and squeezed together and created into these new robotic forms. Robots like Eric or Saigon or George. And all of them stand up and they can move and they can give speeches and they have presentations. And people marvel at them, they're marvellous machines. And what happens next, as people work through how do you make a robot do all these things, is they go from recreating the mechanisms of the body to the mechanisms of the mind. So since the war, we've been building these robots which don't just have these great big steel bodies, but they actually behave in lifelike ways as well. Behaviour is affected by the nature of the body that the robot resides in, as it were. And rather than building these great big steel things, why don't we build robots which are based much more closely on human anatomy? So Rosa, the robot we can see here, is what we call an anthropomimetic robot. What that means is that her design mirrors very closely the anatomy of the human body. At the moment, when you program a robot, you use lots of machine code. But increasingly, people are saying, well, why don't we build robots which respond to conversation or body language, that sort of thing. Inca, from the beginning of the 21st century, was used as a receptionist at King's College in London, as well as giving out directions. She had character, she could tell people off for their dress sense and uh, comment on the weather and that sort of stuff. So a lot of modern robotics has taken the mechanisms of the body and the mechanisms of the mind and stuck them together in new and exciting ways. But that's only ever happened in the laboratory, and the big question is, when robots escape from the lab, what are we going to do? At the turn of the 21st century, robots finally look like escaping the lab and entering our everyday lives. Robots do all sorts of things like jobs that are dull or dumb or dirty or dangerous, everything from building cars to clearing landmines. But what's really intriguing is just how many other things they could do. Another really big question is, what do we want robots to look like? Now, on the one hand, like Kodomoid, we might have robots which are absolutely lifelike, with hair and with facial expressions, and they're very uncanny to us. Or Robots could be like Robo Thespian, who is absolutely robot-like with his aluminium skeleton and all of his insides on display. There's no artifice there. One thing is really clear, however. However robots look or what happens with them next, that decision is not in the hands just of roboticists or engineers. It's with you. We've been reinventing ourselves as machines now for 500 years, and that's a fascinating, almost completely forgotten story. As we built ourselves as robots, we basically built a whole series of mirrors, and the nature and the scope of those mirrors has changed continually. The big question is, where do we go in future? Robots have been automatons. In future, perhaps there might be machines that can think or even have consciousness. Where do we go next with robots? The big question. Let's see what happens.